the talk has the uh, following parts. So I'm going to start with an introduction. I'm going to explain what are the, the, the claims that I'm making here. I'm going to follow up with trying to give you a sense of what, is, what I think is at stake. Maybe uh, you will have different ideas, and, and I'm very much looking forward to, to hear what you guys have to say about that. And then uh, I'm going to move on to uh, present a couple of uh, the uh, sections of the evidence. I'm going to be presenting examples of uh, uh, the research that I've done for these. So the first one, I'm going to be talking about abstractions, tables, and how they relate to the larger narrative that I'm discussing here. And then uh, I'm going to be moving on to talk with specific units uh, that I think is at, they're at the center of uh, this history of uh, organization of quantifiable bodies. Uh, that is the, um, the, at the center of the talk. I'm going to finish up with very brief concluding remarks. OK. Um, and let me start with an episode that was uh, part of the everyday life of cities in the Atlantic during the 17th century. On April 29, 1667, Alan Lobo and Francisco Ramirez reported to Spanish Crown officials in Cartagena de Indias, today Colombia, the results of a procedure that by then was routine in most Caribbean places. Lobo and Ramirez, a physician and a Berber sur surgeon, respectively, had spent the best part of the day examining the bodies of 87 men, women, and children in a small house not far for, from the Contaduria Wharf in Cartagena. Methodically, Lobo and Ramirez felt pulses, prodded abdomens, and peered into the mouths of their subjects, searching, smelling, rabbit. They licked faces, tasted sweat, sweat and tears, inserted their fingers into sores, and made convolutions with arms and legs. They measured heights and surveyed skins searching for the telltale marks of life's vicissitudes, tumors, scars, ulcers, and poxes. Finally, they registered and tabulated each pound and inch of flesh. They added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided, summarizing these 87 human beings into 47 and a half units, numbers that they calculated on the basis of a standardized ideal for human bodies. Lobo and Ramirez inscribed these abstractions in documents that swallowed these people's whole being and moved it yet again across the Atlantic, this time as traces of ink. <coughs> Myriad similar episodes ensued during the centuries long history of the transatlantic slave trade. And I start this talk with this episode to remind us that the history I'm tracing in this project is one of unimaginable violence. The apparent dehumanizing nature of the logics infused in the history I'm about to discuss, I think, still inform the way we see each other. A large historiography has examined in detail the record registering procedures similar to the ones undertaken by Lobo and Ramirez. The afterlife of the forms of valuation I described about organized not only the appropriatization of land and life, but also, as we know, the racialized value of human beings with the privileging of white. The history of science and medicine has also been connected to the history of capitalism in numerous ways. Surprisingly, however, little work has been done in examining the relationship between the emergence of notions of quantifiable medical bodies, public health, epidemiology, and the ideas that Iberian Atlantic slave traders developed during the first two centuries of the emergence of the transatlantic slave trade. Ideas present in documents extant at the archive I examine in this project. These records make clear the scribbles written by Lowe and Ramirez rendered bodies into concepts that were articulable with the new language of capital, finance, and measurable risk that came to define in fundamental and decisive ways the character of early modernity. Flesh was now digested by the intangible apparatus of future labor, debt, and credit to sustain the economy of the Atlantic world, a realm in which limbs and organs assume a new pliability that allowed for their universalization and that of the illnesses that developed. 
In the following 40 minutes, I will explore the development of novel ideas about the human body and disease that appear in Iberian Atlantic slave markets during the 16th century and the first decades of the 17th century. These new epistemologies, I argue, conceive of fungible and universal bodies that were measurable and comparable as were the diseases that affected them in quantifiable and reproductible ways on the basis of normalized constant standards. The cut of my argument thus is the idea that the production of the slave trade, which in essential terms implied the production both of material goods and social relations, and by extension of human beings, transform universal early modern relationships with the human body that go beyond the ideation of racialized notions of difference. The grammar of public health, epidemiology, and biomedicine, I believe, sees its early iteration in the conceptual logic appearing in the registration and bureaucratization of the value of the slave bodies and the insertion into the logic of the early modern states and its mercantile economies. In other words, and paraphrasing Michel de it was through the language of the slave trade that they entered our modern scriptural economy and became visible and calculable or verified. And I'll make clear that my objective here is not to identify one unique point of departure or one clear genealogy. Rather, I am to explore how this history uh, of slavery is implicated in the, in the history of shared legacies, right? Uh, this history is of the bodies of modernity. I'm interested in what our cards will look at when we're thinking about uh, those, uh, those trajectories. Uh, but before uh, going and turning to the rest of the paper, I want to briefly to introduce a note, note of caution. The slave was, were not obviously only uh, the channel of yesteryear's stories of the early modern era. So a number of works uh, over the past decades have made clear African and their descendants created rich worlds in the Atlantic whose exploration I and others have been arguing are crucial to understanding the ideation of knowledge making about the natural world in the 17th century. Such recognition allows to reposition historical actors such as 17th century black people as effectual agents on a maturity from which they had been metaphysically excel in traditional existing historical narratives of knowledge production. So it permits us to see them not only as a culturally acculturating agents or as reactive to that maturity, but rather as rightful innovators and shapers of its confirms. So in addition to that, uh, what I think is a, it's an important recognition, I think that the incorporation of these uh, histories of knowledge production coming from slavery is also essential uh, for the, the kind of rethinking these trajectories, especially in, rela in relationship to the histories of medicine and corporality. So what is at stake? Um, and uh, what, what is kind of the, the narrative that, that, that we know? So as scholars traditionally identify ideas or quantifiable bodies as related to the rise of the new science and political and medical arithmetics in late 17th century and 18th century English, mainly English, later French and Northern European learned circles. Most famously, obviously, in the work of William Petty, um, of which it's an example that appears in the, uh, from the 1650s on, in which he established the basis for political arithmetics and models for thinking about labor, health, and national productivity as linked. Independent of its origin, there is an agreement among historians that the shift from seeing any person as naturally unique to naturally common is one of the markers of that uh, transition. Numbers and quantification of disease and death this literature sustained provided the underlying link between natural law, biology later, and the human uh, body. Historians of medicine have traced this development through the history of physiology and biomechanics, the appearance of hospitals as houses, as houses of science, the rise of mosology, trade in mature America, the history of the smallpox vaccination, life insurance, and the crafting of the first tables of mortality and morbidity among others. The new model's presence in these narratives famously demonstrated the universality of human bodies and the existence of disease as ontological entities, even if such development is acknowledged to be an even contested and messy. There's not, not, not a linearity here either. I wanna, these new entities, diseases, could also be measured as abstract units that congeal the health body status of larger groups to be inserted specifically in a state sponsored enterprises that were susceptible to mathematical truth. So, as I hope it become clear in the following 
Man, it's these foundational ideas, I believe, were already in some form in place and circulating decades, if not a century early, in 16th and 17th century Atlantic slave trading societies. And this is evident in what is arguably the larger, largest collection of numerical data related to human bodies before the rise of the modern state in, 18 and 19, in the 18th and 19th century. And I will say that those are the ones studying the slave trading related records that are governmental accounting and notarial in nature in places like Spain, specifically in the House of Trade in the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, in Portugal, in the Caribbean, and Brazil, and in southern Iberian Italy and the low countries. Again, trying to think what is when we're thinking about this history of num bodies and numbers, what is, the, what is that we're looking at? And I have to say that the history that I'm talking about here is not one of scientists or learned physicians, although there are medical practitioners involved, instead of one that is mainly uh, of bureaucrats, accountants, financiers, and merchants of different goods. The techniques of measurement and registry that early SLA trading societies used were intended to objectify, codify, and standardize forms of knowledge making, and also create, through her, their inscription and repetition, harder facts that will become normative. And I say societies, and this is an, an, an important point uh, here, uh, because a large community of historical actors located around the Atlantic, in Spain, Portugal, in Northern Europe, and increasingly throughout the century in England uh, and France, the, all of these people were interested in the creation of new models from which to profit, not only from humans, humans' bodies' labor, we know that history, but also from the work that those abstract units of slave bodies did in creating wealth. So it was not only slave traders, right? And when we think about slave traders, we think about these isolated communities. They are embedded in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the economies uh, and, and social life of places like Seville, like Cadiz, like Cartagena de Indias, like Amsterdam in the mid 17th century. Um, uh, and they involve financiers, private investors, family members, and friends mortgaging their houses to upgrade ships, and physicians and surgeons investing in the trade among others. They were all conversing with the concept I'm about to discuss, and this is an example uh, of uh, private transactions and loans between private actors in Seville, in Spain, that were investing in the slave trade through the mortgaging of their homes as securities in the 1670s. As I said before, similar dynamics were present in places like Lisbon, Amsterdam, Cadiz, later in London, and Nantes. So with this background in mind, let's turn to the evidence. While emphasizing that what I'm talking about here is is representative of uh, several other hundreds of similar examples. And I want to begin with a table. Uh, one of the technologies that historians of science have located firmly, firmly at the center of the Bacanian revolutions of the 17th century. This one, however, comes from an unexpected place. So the table that you have in front of you is one of 12 containing a rich document sent by Miguel de Corcuera, one of the accountants of the Spanish crown in Cartagena and Indias in the Kingdom of uh, Granada, so before modern day Colombia to the House of Trade in Seville. Cartagena was, by then, the main slave entrepot in the Americas, and Corcuera was obviously in the thick of it. Here in the map, uh, we can see the uh, location of uh, Cartagena, the Indias, and uh, some of the mining sound that emerged in the region in the 16th and 17th century. And I just, uh, be, beyond locating Cartagena, I want to remind that the Spanish Caribbean was the region that up to the mid 17th century received the lion's share of all the slave trade coming into the new world, they arriving in places like Cartagena. They didn't, did not stay there, but they arrived there. 400,000 up to uh, 1670 compared, for instance, with 1,000 to North America, and about 30,000 to Brazil. In the report, dated June 17, 1662, Corcuera scrutinized a contract that the Spanish crown had made with Captain. Alonso Trujillo de Llebra for bringing a slave to work in the silver mines of Las Lajas in the town of Mariquita, a place that was 700 miles as the crow flies south of Cartagena. The accountant wrote that he had total, quote, until the last maravedi, comparing the scheme proposed by Trujillo de Llebra with another thing with the, in which the crown will bring slaves directly from Africa and which he said were clearly more advantageous. Corcuera, a man of his science, reported the validity of his scheme on the fact that he had based the report on factual information obtained directly from the people who knew most about bodies risk and money in the Atlantic. Those who made the Armazones de Negros, the ship 
loads of enslaved Africans from Guinea, and Guinea, and Angola, and the shipmaster who transported them to the Indies. Corcuera also consulted medical practitioners working with slave traders and sellers about, quote, the more practical and intelligent ways that there are in this kingdom of buying slaves from Guinea and Angola and transporting them to the Americas. In making his calculations about how to maximize the capital invested in the purchase of slaves, Corcuera made sure to compute the gains coming not only from the commodities produced by the slaves, which were in the calculation, but also the money that transactions around these abstractions in contract between slave traders, bankers, and buyers could provide the crown. So for this, it was essential to make claims about a generalized population that he called un lote, a lot of a slave. This is following the practice, and he specified this in, in, in the document, following the practice of a slave trader who would also thinking and trading with lots, not with individuals. This work became the norm in contemporary slave trading uh, contracts, insurance, and, and purchases in Cartagena, Seville, Lisbon, and Amsterdam. So slave buyers were not thinking, and sellers were not thinking about the purchases and gains of buying individuals, but groups of enslaved Africans. Corcuera explained the three main risks of trading in slaves. First, the ship sinks and is lost in the sea. Second, that the enemy takes over the ship. And third, that the slave gets sick of pestilence and a general disease. He then proceeded to calculate in detail the price of bringing slaves from three regions in Africa, Upper Guinea, specifically the rivers of Guinea, Ayada in the Bight of Benin, and Angola in West Central Africa. So, for instance, the purchase and transportation of each Angolan slave to Cartagena cost, in Corcuera's calculations, 1,483 reales. He estimated that in the Middle Passage, the debt rate for the slaves, in general, this is making from those facts that I was mentioning before, was 10%. Based on average from previous trips, only 450 or 500 slaves purchased in cities like Luanda and Angola will arrive in Cartagena. Corcuera tallied the price of dead slaves to the price of the remaining lot. In addition to the price of a slave, the accountant computed the cost of the licenses, administrative fees, and other taxes that slave traders needed to pay for each slave. This accounted to 56 reales. Corcuera also included the price of transportation from Cartagena to the Lajas mines, which he said was about 60 reales uh, per slave. Finally, Corcuera added the price of the slave who died en route from Cartagena to the mines, which he calculated to be 3%. The accountant added an interest of a rate of 10% of the capital that the slave buyers were borrowing in the form of body slots to the final calculation of the crown's profits with the scheme he proposed. After this, make, doing this for each group, he compared the, the three groups that, that I just mentioned, uh, Upper Guinea, Ayala, and Angola. And he specified the value of the items that slave traders exchange, grouped in the famous bundles of goods, iron, firearms, fabrics, uh, also called benzos that Europeans traded in Africa for enslaved people. And he discussed how much wholesale slave buyers paid for lots of slaves in Cartagena, and the amounts and terms under which traders sold slaves to gold and silver miners. Wholesale slave traders bought captives from, for instance, the Guinea River Sapper Guinea for 260 pesos and then sold them on credit for 280 pesos. For again, calculated in the terms of 500 slaves with all the deductions and uh, proportions that I just ma uh, mentioned, calculation of risks of around 10,000 pesos of common silver. The quantities here are not important as, as the, 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 the concept that they're playing with. It's another important one that Corcuera also specifically calculated the amount of money that the Crown will save by purchasing these slaves in relation to the ratio of labor commodity produced instead of using Amerindians who were at the time employed in forced labor systems called encomiendas and repartimientos, in the minds that, that these still abstract slaves will be working. This is, there is an explicit ideation of bodies here, at least as related to labor productivity, that, uh, that made those bodies comparable, both Amerindian and African bodies. This is figured prominently in Corcuera's calculation. In his estimate, he detailed the price of barbers, medicine physicians, and funerary expenses for those who died upon arrival. And that Corcuera was thinking in these terms could be surprising. But as slave traders have come to focus not, again, as I said before, not only on loss of slaves, but not, uh, not either in individual body bodily diseases. They were already thinking in terms of diseases that they could factually identify 
as universal. This is as ontological entities that were common to groups of human beings uh, to make a profit out of them. They view the view the diseases as affecting lotus. What is crucial here is that the disease through this um, move becomes calculable and predictable. And there are plenty of similar examples. Uh, for instance, Portuguese slave traders Blas de Paz Pinto in Cartagena and Miguel Diaz Pimienta in Recife, Brazil, made a fortune trading on a specific disease slave bodies uh, that uh, were sick of entities they called Dicho and Tabardillo, which they also conceive as corcueras quantifiable, computation about investment of capital and predicted gains on the basis of how they affected these groups of human population, and also importantly, on the effectiveness of the treatment that they have devised for that specific disease. I'll be happy to talk more about this in the, in the Q&A. Blas de Paz Pinto and Diaz Pimienta were not the only ones, ones thinking in terms of the future. Corcuera also made projections of labor, productivity, and importantly, human life span in his Dublin, how such projections will produce gains for the crown on the basis of interest, interest that a slave purchase has paid for loans up to five years. These type of computations, the ones that Corcuera is articulating by the beginning of the 17th century, are the same that the literature argue were part of those fundamental innovation of political economics and life insurance tables in 17th and 18th century. Invention that, by the way, gave rise to the possibilities of demographic and epidemiological computations later in the 19th and 20th century. Thus, to summarize, the entire scheme proposed by Corcuera was based on the naturalized and mathematized possibilities of not yet purchased slave bodies and diseases. This calculation depended on the quantification of generalized groups of human beings as related to origin, health, and how they were linked to profit in terms of possibilities for labor. And crucially, Corcuera did so by investigating facts and numerical data coming from, to use William Pettis' name, the surveyors of this human landscape. So you might wonder, what changed? What is new here? Right? After all, the fact that slave traders examine and appraise bondsmen and women on the basis of age and illness should come as no surprise. And indeed, the historical record shows that slave traders and buyers work alongside physical examiner to appraise human merchandise from Greek times onward. But slavery in the ancient world and in the Middle Ages had, had different configurations. Slave bodies were valued on an individual base, basis and price accordingly. These type of valuations, the one that uh, were in place in, in the Atlantic uh, by the early uh, 16th century, did not work for the new merchants of the flesh. During the 16th century, slave traders, financiers, and European states, prominently Spanish and Portuguese mercantile states, confronted what I think of as a crisis of representation of the human body. As is evident in Corcuera's case, these historical actors were not simply putting prices on human beings. Like previous slave traders, these merchants of the flesh evaluated enslaved people's corporality in groups as a way of thinking to a future capital gains. This is, and, and they transacted upon these valuations. This is before the slaves themselves were physically examined. To adapt themselves to these new necessities of representation, Atlantic slave trade communities moved from these older frameworks of thinking about human bodies based on the addition of human bodies as affected by individualized diseases to one to conceive of those universal bodies that affect diseases, but you could uh, quantify to, as is evident in the cases of Corcuera, Diaz Pimienta, and Pinto. In other words, the tools that the older Aristotelian, Galenic, Hippocratic models provided for the conceptualization of the human body were not sufficient for these risk based capital producing enter uh, prices. And, and uh, uh, what I have here is just a uh, 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 an example of, of uh, the, those books in circulation in the early modern period that were providing that longer uh, trajectories of Galenic hypocratic uh, epistemologies. Uh, epistemologies, by the way, will, will be a still dominant in most uh, um, uh, medical communities throughout the 18th and 19th uh, century. <clears throat> so, Corcuera's calculation also pointed out to other fundamental innovation of slave traders. And that is the fact that you can conceive in quantifiable abstract terms of disease. So it's both grouping bodies, making them universal, and being able to conceive of disease as something that 
can be quantifiable. So for the early modern transatlantic slave trade to be functional, I'm paraphrasing Lorraine Stassen, the body needed to be conceived in abstract terms as constant, universal, and moreover predictable and orderly enough to yield mathematical treatment, as crude and primitive as such mathematical treatment was. It was only with the explosion of these transatlantic slave trade that these fungible universal abstract units became an absolute necessity for international commercial exchange, for the elaboration of contracts, loans, insurance, and so on and so forth. And this is uh, what we'll be talking about in, in, in this uh, next section of the talk. What are these units that I am referring uh, to? During the first decades of the 16th century, slave traders and slave trader organization, including the House of Trading Civil, developed methodologies that allowed them to put a slave bodies into numbers and calculate the inherent value of core property as it related to an increasingly normalized constant uh, units. And they call these units cabeza, pesa, pieza, pieza esclavos, and pieza de indias. And um, these are concepts that are very well known to certain historians uh, of slavery, historians of the African diaspora. The concept of pieza, as distinct from that of the body, is later referred to uh, in terms of head or black, for instance, allow for the creation of contracts. As I was mentioned before, where investors, providers, and the state could prospectively calculate tariffs importantly, gains and risk. We'll be talking a little bit about, specifically about the, the, this concept. So, the term pieza, pesa in Portuguese, had been in use since the 16th century in African localities to refer to the body of the slave. It's an example coming from Lisbon and Cabo K. Vergi in 1529. And the existing literature associates, and as I'm sure many of you uh, know, the origin of the term pieza, piece, two pieces of fabric exchanged for slaves in those 15th and early 16th century Portuguese trading ports in West Africa. Face value, these historiographical, uh, this connection makes sense. Pieces of cloth were indeed one of the few fixed units of exchange that exist in Sub-Saharan Africa at the time. However, I believe that this history is at the very least incomplete. Even if the origin of the term relates to such exchange, it is also clear that other circular intersections augmented and complicated the meaning and uses of the concept. So the evidence I have examined suggests that 16th century slave traders' increasing sophistication of this concept was intimately related to knowledge coming from shipping and commercial tradition in the Mediterranean, a large transformation that were happening in those mercantile circles, as I mentioned above. From very early on, traders referred to groups of slaves arriving in the New World as being as part of a, an Armazón de Negros, an organized ship load of slaves including registered for slaves from 1536 to 1560. And I have these, an example from royal decrees that are about the organization of Armazons in Spain in 1522. Each Armazon was organized, measured, and registered in the House of Trade by Armadores, shipping master in the Mediterranean maritime world. The important link here to our story is that Armazones were made out of pieces, and, and Armazones were not only uh, shiploads of, uh, uh, of human beings, they were Related to all sorts of merchandise. And these Armazones, as I said before, were made, made out of pieces, of pieces. The palmeo, the method that slave appraisers in America used to measure the bodies that were making those Armazones of uh, enslaved Africans, was indeed nothing more than the appropriation of a technique that shipping masters already widely used to uh, size other types of merchandise that they also called pieces. Merchandise in piezas had the privilege of the palmeo. And these piezas were usually coffers, bundles, chests, or other large cargo that was not open, not to be open or examined. This is because the House of Trade granted permission to the owners, allowing them to avoid inspection uh, of these specific types of fry. Armadores also used the palmeo method to measure pieces of fry that quote, could not be subdivided into further units. A slave being treated like cargo could not obviously be opened up or further divided. The dispatch fees of piezas subject to palmeo were regulated through palmos, and hence the term name in the procedure, palmos as a unit of payment. The palmeo does abstracted in pieces of merchandise for the introduction as financial construct that could be monetized, taxed, traded, sold, and insured. As other commodities, human bodies became pieces that appear in contracts months in advance of the naturalization 
as physical pride. The use of the term PSA slave during the first decades of the 17th century was disseminated across the Atlantic. The concept was widely used in contracts in Seville, Lisbon, Madrid, and in Dutch trading records. Dutch slave traders, many of them associated with crypto Jewish networks of slave traders in Brazil and the Caribbean, broadly used the PSA when selling the slaves on the Wild Coast, which they called New Zealand in 1658. Terminology related to the concept of the PSA appears not only in legal and governmental contracts, but also in private transactions. The Book of Purchases of Juan Rodrigo Mesa, a Portuguese merchant trading in the 1630s in Cartagena, for example, as an entry uh, establishing that Mesa bought a lot of pieces, of piezas of Angola already in 1630. So obviously what I'm suggesting here is that uh, we have a very complete story about uh, this, this notion of the pieza and that if, if what I'm saying here is correct, that uh, the concept is, is pointing out to larger epistemological uh, changes that are being fueled by African bodies and their abstractions. So how were these enslaved bodies fit within these abstract pieces? So how do we go from pieces to uh, corporality? So when calculating contracts based on pieces, again, these contracts that were negotiated before the slave tra budgets, uh, trading budgets has been started, the slave traders and adherent royal functionaries specifically evaluated the slave bodies in relationship to age, gender, and physical characteristics. The fuller articulation of the concept of the pieza appeared in a series of documents in the context of negotiation between the Spanish crown and a group of Genoese financiers who won the slave asiento contract. And the asiento here only refers, uh, as this is a monopoly contract. It's not only or uniquely related to uh, the, uh, the contracts uh, with slave trading. It's only because we think of the most famous asiento where, uh, that I'm going to be referred to uh, later with the English crown that we think of uh, asiento as uniquely related to the slave trade. Uh, but, but this asiento uh, was, uh, uh, was the one that was adjudicated to those Genoese financiers in 1662. I'm saying here articulation because the concept, and this is another, uh, another idea that I think um, it, is, it is not very clear in the literature in the sense that most, uh, most of the works uh, think about the Piazza de Indias, this concept, as appearing in the mid to um, late 17th century and specifically as related to the Grigos contract. But as is evident in this example coming from Portugal in 15th 37, the concept was already in circulation by the uh, early uh, 16th century. Following the development of the Palmeo, bodily circumstances were measured not in monetary terms, although of course they will be converted into monetary quantities, but rather in proportional deductions subtracted from the ideal normalized unit, the Piesa de Indias, which consisted, as explained in the Grigios Asientos, of, quote, a first rate black male slave aged between 18 and 30 years of age, standing around seven palmos of height. Remember the palmos is that, 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 that unit that uh, was related also to the measurement of other types of merchandise. And this is uh, those seven palmos around 5'4 uh, uh, height and devoid of disease. This Ariel body was of course the one that would produce more capital in terms of commodities, mines, and plantations in the new world. At its inception, the Piazza de Indias was composed was made out of seven parts that they call cuartas. So during a palmeo, human palmeo, practitioners assess the slaves on the basis of height, age, and corporeal, uh, what we call tachas, defects, and deducted cuartas, quarters, and octavas, eighths of the value of that specific value. And what about this in a second? That the quantification of slaves' bodies in Piazas de Indias was based on a measure of height was not arbitrary. Slave traders use height as a proxy for slaves' bodies' histories of health and nutrition and as a predictor of the slave body's potential productivity in terms of physical labor. Height was also, not insignificantly, the most standardizable aspect of bodily quantification for contracts. Remember that this is what I'm showing you here so far. This is contracts and transactions that are being done in Europe between European actors. Um, 
So aspects of battery configuration for contracts that depended on appraisals on the other side of the Atlantic by a diverse array of evaluators. For instance, this is just kind of the, how, how those quantifications will go. Being female or having gray hair meant a reduction in value of one third of a quarta. Lows of a toe, one sixth of a quarta. Ulcers were deducted, one sixth of a quarta. Scurvy to AIDS, plan one sixth. Benign hernia, one, uh, one fourth. A broken navel to AIDS, being one eyes to fourths. A lazy eye, one fourth. Being older uh, than 35 years, married with a one fourth reduction, and so on and so forth. I'm going to be showing you a couple of examples here. So, but before going into the details, I'm going to show you how these, these, uh, how were these uh, concepts uh, put to work. So, uh, you have here uh, the summaries uh, uh, in, uh, um, in correspondence sent from Cartagena de Indias, Portobello, and Panama uh, to the House of uh, uh, Trade in Seville of those conversions from cabezas, heads, individuals, into uh, piezas. I'm going to show you later how, how the procedure actually looks in detail. But I just want to show you that, for instance, in these uh, cases, you have uh, in the first, uh, at the top uh, left, yeah, top left, you have 571 individuals. And at the bottom, this is one ship. And at the bottom, another uh, ship that uh, brought 474 individuals. For the purposes of taxation and for the purposes of the fulfillment of, of the contract and obligations, the, and after the Palmeo, the obligations, those 571 cabezas, heads, in was, were reduced to 509 and 5 fourths of PSS de Indios. The 474 below were reduced to 369 uh, uh, pieces of. And here I'm, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be showing you how is that uh, uh, what is the sort of things that they, they were looking for and some of the terms that they are they are uh, discussing. Uh, this is a, a, a specifics of one of those palmeos, one of those evaluations in, and this one is uh, coming from uh, from Portobello. So at the top you have uh, uh, what uh, we see one uh, big uh, big black with uh, Irima, Hidropesia, and herpes, right? You have uh, somebody else who, uh, who has uh, cameras de sangre. This is dysentery, right? You also have uh, um, down here um, two young uh, children, muleques and mulequillos. These two terms are specifically associated with or used to identify children younger than 11 years of age. And uh, uh, they were usually accounted uh, for the three will make a PSA index depending on the age and health. And if they have uh, further disease, as is the case with uh, these two examples, uh, uh, this uh, muleke here has an ulcer on his ankle, on his right ankle. Uh, the other one was uh, sick of what they call ethical consumption, in some cases for some other people, uh, liver disease. And uh, um, and I have uh, other examples of, of those uh, muleques and mulequillos uh, down here. They uh, and this is uh, this is uh, this is so it's hard to read uh, at least for me hard to read these uh, uh, these records even though I've spent so much time with them. They they are talking about uh, regular calenturas, regular fevers, right? Like as, as if they are uh, that there is any, anything regular here. Remember, we're talking about kids here, right? Like um, and another one of these. Uh, uh, Children that was uh, uh, lame from uh, one of his uh, feet. Obviously, this is people that just arrived after the Middle Passage. You have to remember that too. It's another example uh, in which uh, we see a specific deductions here. I just want to show you how that this works. So uh -huh. the first one is uh, somebody who has a rupture in his right testicle, uh, for which they are deducting three of those uh, units. Uh, the second one, uh, well, the second one is somebody who uh, has what they call a, a flema salada in the two hands. These are kinds of ulcers and eruptions in the hands. And uh, uh, it was lacking a finger in the right foot. And uh, it is deducted two quartas. 
Uh, the third one is somebody who has a, a umbilical hernia, um, and it's uh, the doctor one quarta. And uh, uh, the third one uh, from top to bottom is somebody who has what they call nails in the eyes, and I, this is ulcers on the eyes, and maybe evidence of trachomatosis, and it was the doctor a quarta. Here at the bottom, um, we have uh, uh, deductions of fourth. It's a large deduction for somebody who has dropsy uh, and uh, uh, was deducted fourth uh, quarters for this, uh, this specific disease. So there is always a specific taxonomy here. What are the diseases that are going to be causing more uh, deductions here? And uh, finally here in the, uh, the bottom, uh, you have two, um, two enslaved people that were considered to be Buenas piezas, in other words, that they were they were they, they achieved those standards that we were discussing before and were not deducted. So this is where deductions take place. These two uh, males were not deducted. The systems, as I said before, included measurements to account from nearly every problem that were was identified for the assessors, and they will then convert these units into monetary values, as I mentioned before, based on the place from where the slaves were purchased. So, for instance, in these contracts that, again, were being made, we're going back to the Southern Atlantic, this is a contract signed uh, between, for instance, the Spanish Crown and the English Company of Royal Adventurers. They will pay 95 reales for each pieza de India delivered in Barbados and 100 reales in Jamaica. So there is, again, they're thinking of pieces here differently from what you're actually paying. And the idea of the pieza de India's travel widely and appears in uh, contracts such as this one, uh, that is uh, talking about plantations in Suriname in the 1650s um, in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, this one is another one coming, it's a transcription of another one coming from the 1660, also from Amsterdam. I'm referring to uh, trade to Curacao in the Caribbean. And this one was transcribed correspondence related to the slave trade in uh, saint domingue what today is Haiti, the French colony. And finally, this is the one that appears in the, um, the famous Asiento de Negro the, uh, between the, uh, Spain and England in the 18th century. So the realm in which slave traders describe the fine and count of human slave body differ from that which, in which we have been thinking about this history of uh, corporality, and which appears in the writing of contemporary physicians, surgeons, natural philosophers, and historians. But there are tantalizing intersections among the slave traders and those medical intellectual circles. I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about it in the Q&A. Uh, Petty himself, for instance, was a medical student living in Utrecht in the middle of the uh, 17th century. Uh, but more crucially to the point is that through their dissemination in financial, bureaucratic, legal records and transactions, I believe they became part and parcel of the language of the epoch. Uh, and I will just uh, uh, finish uh, this section by uh, showing you how they also enter in the quintessential project of the Enlightenment, the encyclopedia, and we have the entry for the peace treaties in the um, in the encyclopedia of uh, Diro and the Allen Burke. Okay, let me see. Okay, uh, about to be done. Um, so I'm gonna be finishing up by um, thinking more largely of what what does the, what does this history mean. So I'm gonna invoke here uh, historian Walter Johnson, who following the work of Cedric Robinson has argued that the way in which we live, our own ideas about what human rights are, uh, not to talk about the recalcitrant racial and common parties of late capitalism, are a direct product of the world of plantation of the slave trade. He has recently called attention to the promise of approaching the history of the African diaspora and slavery by bringing 20 and 21st century these ideas about freedom and agency in an attempt to bring back the, what he thinks of the humanity of slaves to the history of the slave trade. So he said that the pardon from ideas about the ways in which slave societies and slave traders dehumanize enslaved Africans is a convenient manner of separating our own quote unquote liberal progressive selves from the violent histories of the early modern era. And I'm citing invoking Johnson here to indicate that his reflection on this kind of category so that his sense of the slave trade uh, used to write about the history of the African diaspora, invites a similar consideration about the paradoxical ways in which historians of medicine and health science have the limited areas of study and their kinds they use. So the history of slavery, I, I think, is not only or uniquely related to the history of race, colonialism, and medical experimentation, 
although it is, of course, like, there, is, there is something larger here. See that the constitutive elements of uh, the grammar of public health, epidemiology, and biomedicine appears for the first time. That concept of logic appearing in the registration and bureaucratization of the value of the slaves. These acts of registration of the slave bodies, uh, normal values in contracts, predicted their behavior and production and calculated revenue, prominently taxation, and credit methodologies to organize bodies worth or shaping social and economic relationships. The technology of codification and registration of the slave traders precede by decades, if not centuries, those developed by life insurance companies or those related to political economy in Northern Europe and England. In the disregard in the manners in which the slave trading communities in African diaspora communities had in conceptualizing these ideas about the universe of quantifiable bodies, dissociates the history of the slave body, the most uncanny commodity of, of all, from the, I believe, closely linked histories of political and ethics, natural law, and scientifically quantifiable bodies. Given the unprecedented magnitude of the commerce of human bodies that emerged, involving at the very least 12 million African slaves, Listen to millions more who died in wars associated with the trade and the middle passage. Few other developments and ideas about the quantification of the body and the relationship between labor and individuals had a more profound or widespread effect during the early modern era. This transformation at the same time produced a standardized corporality and made all human bodies apposite for mass calculations of risks, profits, and losses. Bodies ready to be inscribed in the new languages of governmentality and science. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, get your hands up and I'll take the rest off. Thank you so much for the talk. I'm just, I'm just wondering, this conversion from Cabeza to Piedra, you see a constant deduction. It's always negative three, negative four. What is, how is that related at all to the opposite side of this? Are there ever moments of, you know, this person is a plus four? Or like you know, a general technique of improvement. Or no, it is always. If I understand, thank you for the question, right? Like, if I understand what you're saying correctly, is, is if there is kind of a, a from that idea, ideal, you can have a somehow a superhuman, right? Like, it's always a doctrine, right? Like, so that's what I show you. That that is uh, in the terms of the actual uh, examinations. Those uh, not having a deduction mean that you have to work within that that those parameters that were very clearly established by like eighteen. 35 uh, without diseases of a certain height and male. So, yeah, they didn't have additions to those. Although, this is important, right? Like, there were a specific, this is in the contracts, right? Like, remember that we're talking about how they are organized in those in the imagination, right? In the legislation that is that organizing this scriptural economy. Now, that doesn't mean that the slaves, now, once they enter the market, do not, you know, carry higher prices because of what they did, what, what uh, for instance, healers, right, or blacksmiths, right, like, uh, will be bought, bought it, it at a higher price, regardless of how, what the calculation is there. So I'm talking here is more about that kind of larger abstract unit that, that is kind of allow them to, to make and, and, and trade with those abstractions. So, yeah. So, a related question. In the, in the document you showed, you, you very clearly show the, the, the way in which um, an expert values a list of a, a number of, of persons, right? But then do you get do you get a sense of of of, of, of challenges to that valuation of Absolutely. the of course. Uh, at the moment of transaction, let's say, but also in other types of documents that you were saying you so, so you show how the how uh, universal let's let's say it was the, the adoption of the of the of the, of the term, mm -hmm. yes, uh, but what is, uh, was there also disagreement at, the, mm -hmm. at that a more, what, more conceptual level of what a, a Dutch, an English, a Spanish, a French understood by yes. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a very good, right, like so, the, the, the Palmeos were heavily contested, right, like, on, on, you know, by slave traders, right? Like you have usually two sets of evaluators, right? Like one that is, and especially because what we have here are either, we know of these palmeos either because uh, we, uh, they were sent as part of those accountant records or because there were, uh, there were legal proceedings 
as is the case with the, with the egregious, against them for smoking, right? Like, obviously, it will be in the benefit of, of the, the slave trader if in, if in the evaluation you have less pieces of Indies, right? Like, so you will want to have more slaves that were characterized as sick, uh, the more slaves that were characterized even as, as about to die, you know. Alman Boca was in Costala, they will used to call him, right? Like, the, so the government, actually, and the crown in this case, will be will have uh, these two sets of experts, right? Like going into, into the ship. So, but this is this is the interesting thing, right? Like we're talking about this abstract unit being deployed. They were contested, right? Like they were contested, but not on the basis of the validity of the units, but how they are actually applied to human bodies, right? And and again, this is it is the same thing that that you can say about the universalization, the quantification of human bodies. It is always contested, right? And and the problems of trying to fit. Uh, what we think about human corporality in numbers or predict risk. It was contested, it was contested not only by uh, the general population, but by practitioners throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, right? As it is today, right? Like, so now, the other question, one of the reasons why the PSI India has obviously become so, so prevalent as a concept, it's a concept that, that appears in the contract, it is because of the control that the Spanish crown had over the, you know, the legal you know, entrance of uh, the slave trade into the Americas. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, that doesn't mean that the, that the, the Piesa de Indias was the. I like to believe it is. Or I like to think of it as an articulation of something larger that is happening in the Atlantic, rather than being kind of the only way in which we think we can think about those processes of thinking about future. Right. Like what this signals to me is that these communities, uh, even if they are smuggling like from the Canarias, from Cabo Verde, from Angola to Brazil. They still are having similar processes. As is ex exemplified in the cases, that's why I brought the case of Diaz Pimiento, right? Or, 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 um, or Blas de Paz Pinto. They are thinking of diseases as universal. They actually wrote books about those diseases as universal and treat this as universal. And they're buying lots of slaves that they will buy a sick, make calculations, okay, I'm going to buy 100 slaves, uh, they're, they're, and this is the money that I'm going to pay for them. 30% of them, of these specific diseases, are going to die. But, but I'm going to make this profit with this trip. Right? Like, this is very different from thinking about, you know, again, Galenic individualized bodies that you're saying, they, they are they, they are affected individually. Right? Like, so, but that is a very good question, right? Like, because it is because of, of the prevalence of those Spanish contracts, right? Like, that these concepts that are, are all Mediterranean origin made their way in, t in, all, in, all these, in all these legal apparatuses, mm -hmm. right? Like, but that is part of that scriptural economy that I'm talking about here. They became normative, right? Ways of thinking. Calculation of risk, and that, that, I mean that's what I think the, the example of Corquere, the, the Corquere is so is so telling, because he's not only talking about the Middle Passage here; he's also talking about the locality between Cartagena and Indias and Las Lajas. And he's saying like this is three percent, right? Like in that movement, right? Like, uh, but there is calculation that every single uh, mine owner, plantation owner, slave trader. I mean, Suman shows this uh, very well in his wonderful uh, latest book. This is not like, uh, but, but it is true, right? Like uh, that there are specific ways in which the locality. Uh, both in the Caribbean, in South Asia, in Brazil, it is very important in the ways in which they are thinking about how they are deploying these concepts, these units. Right? Like, uh, you have issues of geography, issues of uh, uh, mobility, issues uh, related to availability of resources, the kind of work that you're doing. Certain kinds of plantations are going to be uh, harder, right? Like, uh, and then later in the 18th century, reproduction is going to be important here too. One, one, another important uh, issue here is to think that the, the history, we tend to think about this history as related to the plantation world of the Caribbean in the 19th century, but we have to remember that most people came, coming into the, the, those early trips were mostly to work in mines, right? like in mines, silver and gold mines in, well, in Peru, 
in, in Spain and in the Kingdom of Granada, gold and silver mines, right? Like, and they, they will also work in, in haciendas, right? And, and in failed attempts at plantations. Uh, but it's in that context that they develop. And so they, uh, it's a broad sort of calculation, right? like, but it's one that, that, that he, 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 we don't have anything related, again, related to productivity towards the future. We don't have anything of that sort uh, before. So. Uh, yeah, so the last point that relates to, to one of the earlier questions is you mentioned it, that it's all about the standardization and the contract and the transfer. And yet, then something else might happen in the market. And so, I guess my question is what's the relationship? Or not just were there legal disputes about the contracts, but were there legal disputes where, or other kinds of disputes where the market price doesn't, does it use the, the, the same language? Does it use the same valuations? Are there explicit changes in the way there's discussion of the valuation? Mm -hmm. So, there, again, the, so the, 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 the and this is what is interesting about like going beyond the asiento contracts or the contract between the slave traders into those notarial records, right? Like, because you see people thinking and using the very same terminology, right? Like to talk about that, what is the sort of of, uh, of returns that they will have, and even when they are thinking or using right, like uh, individual units around like pesos, uh, not pesos, but heads of the slaves, or we'll call it negros, right? Like blacks in general, they are also thinking with the same kind of logics, and that is what I'm interested in. In, 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 in reality, right, like uh, not not so much so, of, as I said at the beginning, tracing a unique genealogy, right, like for the concept of the Pieza de Indias or the Pieza, and thinking more about what Corcuera is doing, right, like what allows people to start thinking about groups of human beings as something that we can measure, right, like and especially with the health of human beings as something to measure. And there's something that becomes very important in those individual transactions, something that you see happening both. In Amsterdam, but also in Cartagena de Indias, uh, the, the, there was a spe the, Cartagena de Indias was the main slave in Chapo, and you have bankers and financiers that settle in Cartagena for the specific purpose of providing loans outside of the regulation, also right, of the Spanish crown to those individuals. So the, the richest man, one of the richest man in Cartagena, uh, Blanquecia, was actually somebody who provided loans at a specific rates, depending on, and, and that is an interesting thing, depending on. The time, right? Like uh, the, the availability of the slaves, right? Like, but with very specific ideas about how many of those slaves will die, and that is also what the slave buyer will be that was purchasing those slaves will be thinking about. Okay, how many of them will be dead? Uh, how many of them will die in transportation? Right? Like, so they are thinking about risk here again in terms of this. I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, it's just kind of that, that larger thing that it, it translates into the market in a very specific way. Trying to sort of tie this to um, conceptualizations of disease and tie to a sort of history of public health. And do you see sort of arising from, from these documents that you're looking at, these histories, a kind of idea of, of diseases being conceptualized in different ways? Like, do you see a sort of a, a same quantification or evaluation of diseases, you know, that these particular ones are worse than others, that then arises and, you know, sort of beyond this? Mm. and goes into a sort of more public health mm -hmm. network where now it's not just in the slave trade. Now it's thinking about mm -hmm. public health in a city, public health in mm -hmm. uh, a region. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I, are, are you, you want to engage with that? Do you see that arising? So this is, I mean, the, 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 that, is, that is a very important question, right? Like, and, and for me, uh, so far in the project, I'm being very interested in, in calling attention to specific kind of practice that are not, not in other words, that, that I don't think the importance of these archives is uniquely related to the fact that certain kind of medical and public health, or figures in the history of medicine and public health, are kind of related to this. Uh, but as I mentioned before, again, people like William Petty, uh, there are people who have been involved in the slave trade, and Petty himself used terms coming from the slave trade, like heads, right, like labor productivity, in the, in the question of, of those ideas about political arithmetics later in the um, in the 18th century, right? Like, uh, ideas about uh, medicine, for instance, there were some books that were coming out specifically of slave traders. The issue with that sort of specific ascription is that the world of academic medicine, right, like, was very resistant for obvious reasons. And this relates to the question that I, I think Ernesto or somebody asked. 
uh, about the, the arrival of numbers, right, as, as a way of uh, epistemic authority, right? Like, uh, and this is a conflict that will carry on throughout the 18th and 19th uh, century. This appears more and more in, 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 in governmental accounts related to, for instance, again, tables of mortality, morbidity. Uh, and Eastern medicine had thought of, of linking, uh, for instance, the trade of medicine, right, like with ideas about how, early ideas about how bodies can be thought of as universal, not uniquely as uh, related to, uh, to individuals. So there are connections certainly be between those, those two words. Uh, and, uh, but again, I, I think that what I'm mostly interested here is also to point out not only to those connections, right, like, and there are also connections between circles of, uh, uh, of enslaved traders, factors like uh, Feroni in, in, uh, in Genoa and Amsterdam, and uh, people like both having in the late 17th century. But most, most interesting is like, what is what we also think as a, as a, as a discipline belongs into the archive of uh, the histories of knowledge making. So, but, but, but certainly, but there's a tension there if, if you know what's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The new notion is that suddenly capitalism introduces the idea of racism and uh, dehumanization into it, where at the moment or Indian or African or whatever, everyone could become a slave, or it's an unfortunate thing, it was not really for slaves to have a higher status in the future than whatever, like you don't have this strong component of dehumanization in racism. How does the play out changes? I mean, how does it play out? Did you notice anything? How do you, like, does this whole question of, like, how the market and et cetera change with that? Is there a way to, because you said there, I mean, there are other accounts that yes. before, yeah. but we didn't have this, like, with, with, yeah, with the 15th century, we have this new element mm -hmm. where, like, it becomes, like, a dehumanization and a completely Okay. If I under, and, and understood the question correctly, uh, you're asking like, so how or in what ways does that change the kind of models, right? Like this history that I, that I'm talking about, and what is different, more largely, of what, for instance, the the, the Romans were doing, right? Like, so there are specific accounts, right, like that the, of legislation in, in ancient Rome. Uh, that referred to the price of slaves, right? Like, and the Romans, and it was not only um, uh, individual, but also the Roman army, for instance, uh, used thousands of slaves, and spent a large amount of expenditure was uh, was related to the slave trade. The difference here is that they are talking about monetary units, right? When they are thinking about the slaves and how they are purchasing them, their prices that are set up by, for instance, the Roman state, right? Like. Obviously, the slave trade was not only Roman, it was happening in different sorts of types of markets, both in West and West Central Africa, in the Americas. So it, it is, slavery is not, is not a product, as you were correctly implying, of, uh, of the 16th and 17th century. What I think it is new here, and what actually adds to that logic uh, of, uh, um, of dehumanization and racialization, right, like, which are inserted here, we know those histories very well, the creation of capital through slavery, uh, and a history that, that until recently had been thought of as, okay, uh, no, these, these guys were not even early capitalists, the, the sla slavery was not really related to the emergence of modern economic projects because, uh, because it really doesn't, doesn't, does, that doesn't have the, the same kind of logics of capitalism as, or, or modern capitalism. And, and this is what the new history of, sla of the slavery and capitalism has been arguing about during the during the past uh, few years, uh, so, but at the same time, right, like that, that uh, we know those histories of differentiation. There is a history here that I think it is is more profound. It is a history of commonality, right, like that allows for the emergence of notions that we think of as very common to think again, as I said before, about our own health, about uh, the measurement of risk related to this is, right, like, uh, that I think can be lost if we are only thinking about those 
systems as primitive, as racist, as, and they were racist, they were brutal, they were violent. But they are violent in ways that are also linked to, uh, to our own issues also with those sort of constructions today. So, uh, so I don't know if that answers uh, the question specifically, but, uh, but there are certain differences here, very specific about what is the nature of what those units can do. But that related to finance and capitalism as it emerges again in the 16th and 17th century. Uh, mercantilism, if you want to talk about it, or pre-capitalism, whatever you, the sort of uh, ways in which bodies start functioning before they actually are, you know, are, are in the flesh in, as, as producers of wealth. So. Question, yes. Um, just a quick question for appearances, always quarters. Are, are PSL? Always quarters. In Diderot, they were counting in 25 cents, right? So They're quarters or, 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 or eighths. Quarters or eighths, but yeah. not Qu quarters. Quarters or eighths. That is, yeah. It was siete quartos. See, that actually is super interesting to me because, mm -hmm. like, if you look at the like Roman slavery, mm -hmm. children cost less than adults. We already, yeah. sick people cost less mm -hmm. and maimed people cost less mm -hmm. than healthy people. We already have those reductions. Mm -hmm. We also, slave traders buy in mm -hmm. groups. They don't just buy in mm -hmm. individuals, even if they sell in individuals. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this, I think, is already there. But this element, the fact that the way that you count these minimizations are in standard units, yeah, that, that piezas come in eighths yeah, or quarters, exactly. that actually- No, no, that, 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 is, I mean, that is at the core that of this, right? That seems to be the crucial thing. Yeah. So that a piece is limited. There are quanta for pieces, Absolutely. is I think the actually novel bit here. Otherwise, I don't know that there's necessarily a lot that we haven't seen before. Even the futurity thing, I mean, when you count soldiers, part of what you're doing is fighting strength. So unprepared soldiers yeah, no, that, that, count for less than fully prepared soldiers absolutely. in a future battle. So futurity is mm -hmm. in there in those calculations too. The piece seems to be the one new thing here that I can think of. Yeah, but, you, but yeah, I mean, certainly the, that's what I, I make so much emphasis, right, yeah. on, the, on the fact of standardization, yeah. on the fact of quantification, on the fact that that is what is being traded. But that's where Ernesto's question about whether other people just call bullshit on this whole economic big quarters or eights. And in fact, you negotiate. No, but they're not negotiating. I mean, what I was answering, the, the answer to Ernesto is that you are not answering about the, the, the concept of the standard unit, right? Like, you are talking about the, how is that those, uh, those units are being deployed in a specific but set and context. Yeah. argue that this shouldn't count as a full quarter reduction. It should count as, you know, a third or, you know, a second. That is what, I mean, that is what you're arguing, right? Like, but that, that doesn't mean that the, that the unit itself the value of the unit and the possibilities for the unit. But this is when this, this is on the other side of the planet. But in the negotiation before those values even exist, right? Like, that is that is not being argued. The possibilities and the possibilities of standardization are not being argued. And the other crucial thing here is the appearance of capital as a possibility for production of wealth on itself, right? Uh, that allows for investment. There are people that are trading with these units again, even for the bodies of the slaves are there. They are not even thinking about uh, whether the slaves are going to be um, sick or not, whether it doesn't really matter here. Right? Like you are producing loans, right? Like you are, yeah. and you are calculating risk, which is also very early modern thing here, thinking about risk in very specific ways. That's what I was saying, like the calculation of the risk of three, 10%. It is numbers here. It's not that you are not thinking again about, uh, as you were saying before, groups of individuals, but the ways in which they are thinking about those groups of individuals is different. The ways in which they are thinking about calculation of risk related to those groups of individuals is different. The same thing with disease. It's not that people, that's what I specified before, it's not that I say like, uh, of course, it's, it's slaves that are, that are sick are going to mm, sell for less, and that is, uh, again, the Justinian legislation is very specific about that, right? like you, and, and the same thing with women, with children. But you are not talking about a specific monetary values here, you are talking about risk towards the future, not only in terms of debt, but also productivity, mortality, morbidity, etc. Which is again, a very important difference, right, and between what is happening in the early modern period in general, right, and what is happening before. So. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, 
um, I was wondering about the influence of uh, um, Islamic slavery or yeah, you know, like, uh, obviously that took place on the, in the Iberian Peninsula. Is it maybe because of this prominence of you know, um, science of history that was used that was to the Arab world and the Arab world in Islam particular mm -hmm. um, as a more to character, um, which also helped somehow. Um, I mean, it was used for everybody, but particularly for slaves, because slaves were, um, at least in Europe, or used in the domestic world. And for that, they had to basically rely on that science to um, judge you know, their character, because they were basically mm -hmm. uh, being integrated into the private sphere. Yeah. And that was, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it, it's a very good question because, again, the trans saharan slave trade, for instance, right? Both that was carried in, in many cases by expanding, right, like uh, Islamic states in Africa itself, but also the slave trade that is larger in the Mediterranean world, right? Like, that's what I, I, I kept making emphasis on the fact that this is not uniquely an Atlantic history, that there is a larger trajectory here, right, about issues of transportation. Uh, and issues of financial market. But I, I guess the answer is similar to what I was just saying before. There are specificities about what is happening in terms of the necessity for certain kinds of contracts and, and instruments, right, for the industries of those contracts that did not exist before, right? Like, but obviously, and you're very right, like uh, the, the, the ways of thinking and the technologies of uh, transportation organization, the trade, they also follow uh, very closely those uh, previous uh, iterations of the trade, not only Roman and Greek. I was just referring to those uh, as, as a way of, uh, of exemplifying something that is happening more largely, yes. So with Suma's question, I was also thinking about the restrictions imposed on, on the way of thinking about value by, 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 by currency, by available currency. Mm -hmm. and, so the, uh, and the key numbers are here, Eight and, and, and thirty-two, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so is, is that part of, of the answer to human question? Uh -huh. No, but the real de ocho. You're thinking about the real de ocho, right? Like yeah. so, the 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 quartas, right? Like remember that that, that I, I mentioned that the, my sense of where the idea of the PS is coming, it is from the ways in which they're measuring PS. Uh, this is an, an idea that is not even uniquely. Spanner in nature or Portuguese. Italians were already thinking about pieces uh, in the uh, 15th century, right? So how do you measure, right? Like through palmos and through quartas, right? Like so, it has a longer history that is possibly the appearance of the real de ocho, right? So and it is again we're talking here about specific and as as, as, as Simon was saying, units that are constant, right? Like and and they are uh, relatable to each other and whose it's a new concept because currency, as you said before, is, is very different in, in the ways in which it is related to the body itself, right? Like in terms of devaluation, in terms of how it travels uh, across uh, different imperial spaces, right? Like that's what I, I, I show also the example of the Royal Company of Adventure, right? Like you will be paying more for a pieza. It is the same individual, right? Like the, that you will pay more in Barbados than you will pay, you'll pay more in Jamaica than you'll pay in Barbados. And this goes back to, to the question about local characteristics. Because most likely that is like that space is gonna uh, is gonna produce less, right? Like, but the ways in which the contract and the tax, this taxation is very important. It is it is described. It is related to the unit itself. Okay, now you stop. Uh, very nicely about slaves. But during the period of time that you're talking, what happened, if anything, uh, with the effects of the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. Because we had the Inquisition, we had people leaving uh, Espana and also Portugal mm -hmm. uh, to come to the New World. What, how did that play in, if it did at all, with uh, some of the uh, studies from? Yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you something interesting about the, the Inquisition. The Inquisition, of course, here is, works as a, a it's, it's, a, it's a tool of the monarchy. You have to remember that, that the Inquisition is a monarchic institution. It's related to the, to the Catholic Church, but it depends on the Spanish monarchy, at least in Spain. Uh, in the case of one of the people that, that I show here, Vlad de Paz Pinto, we know of him. He was prosecuted for being Jewish in the Inquisition in Cartagena. So the Inquisition here functions also as a tool of prosecution 
precisely because of the slave traders uh, in Cartagena uh, were jealous of the power and amount of wealth that this person had acquired. Right? Like, so there is a way in which uh, those, uh, the Inquisition function here also as, economic, as an economic tool, right? Like, so these histories are very closely inter interposed and interlinked, right? Like the, the, the Inquisition is not only preoccupied, and as a matter of fact, it was more than any, anything else uh, preoccupied with the establishment and protection of certain kind of limits. It was not only for uh, the, uh, kind of the, uh, they were not preoccupied so much, uh, that, that is the tenet, right? Like matters of faith, but beyond, beyond those matters of faith, they are talking about imperial limits, right? Like, so Lutherans, Calvinists, there was constant preparation of Inquisition in Carta and other Indias, as well as uh, Jewish networks, right? Like, but this is about money. And, and there, is, there is another aspect of that, is precisely because of that, in, that prosecution that you have networks of people of Jewish descent that ended up in Amsterdam, being connected with people in Cartagena, being connected with people in Portugal, you know, through crypto networks that are, that are very much involved in the slave trade in the Canary Islands in South America already. Uh, and, uh, uh, and again, as this goes back to the question about smoking, right? Like, it is within those communities that that sort of mathematics also being developed very, very strongly. So. I'm gonna ask one last question. So I wonder if we can get at the dehumanization question by noting that what you're arguing in part is that logics that were already established for counting animals, say, were being moved across to count people, right? Yep. So a lot of these te techniques down to partial use and partial value are already being applied to non-human animals. No, right? Not only non-human animals, right? Like, but Plants, we're also talking plants. about like, yeah, uh, like and certain kinds of merchandise that, that, right. that you cannot count. Like you have to wait for instance, or you have to measure. That's what measure here is so important, right. that you cannot uh, quantify it in in uh, itemized, that is the word. So I wonder if part of the question isn't then about uh, the ways that slavery becomes chattel slavery of a particular kind so that you can in fact begin to count people like animals in a new kind of way. This is one of the things of course that people say about new world slavery mm -hmm. that is unlike Roman slavery, mm -hmm. precisely yeah. as chattel slavery. So I wonder is that of, yeah. The problem is how do you transfer from animals to humans, mm -hmm. given that you should not actually be able absolutely. to make that move. But Ab this might be part of the end. No, absolutely. It is, it is certainly so, right? Like, and that's what I was mentioning, that it, we do know, right, like the, that the racial capitalism, the creation of difference, it was closely linked to these sort of processes, right? Like, uh, but it is a process that at the same time, is giving us is giving us two paradoxical uh, results, right? Like one is dehumanization, one, racial and racialization, and this is the the, uh, the question that, that I had before, the creation of a specific categories of human beings, right? Like, but if you as you know this history very well, you know how contested that history was throughout the 17th and 18th century, right? Like uh, in a similar way, because numbers to talk about human beings and units to talk about human beings. Are so problematic, even in the in the face of this colonial imperial space, right? And similarly, the history of uh, the authority of numbers in public health and epidemiology, right? It is similarly contested. But you can see that there, there are parallels, and they they also follow a very similar trajectory throughout the late 17th, 18th century, and into the 19th century. Um, so I, I I totally agree with you that there, it is in the process of measurement and quantification, that the necessity for thinking of, or not, not the necessity, but, but the link becomes very clear in, in a very tangible way, yes. All right, please join me and thank you.